Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. Let's go back and explain the inheritance of this. It's a very important piece of the puzzle. How is this gene inherited and what are the implications for people who have elevated levels of this as far as their offspring? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, so the pattern of inheritance is through autos autosomal dominant uh, pattern of inheritance. So uh, it's like any uh, like for instance, if you compare it with a monogenic disorder, let's say familial hypercholesterolemia. In in Quebec, we have a, a very famous uh, mutation, which is a 15 kilobase deletion in the LDL receptor. So if uh, if you inherit that, then if you inherit at least one copy, you know you'll you'll have FH. For LPA, if you inherit a genetic variant that's associated with high LPA, chances are you'll have high LPA as well because you only need one variant and not necessarily two. So you, you need either the allele from uh, your father or your mother that will uh, rise LPA. But it's a bit more complex than that because we we cannot necessarily consider it a monogenic disorders because there's 2000 different variants in the LPA region that are associated with high LPA. So your father can have a high LPA because of a specific variant and your mother can have an, uh, an, an LPA variant that lowers LPA. But it depends on the combination of SNPs that you will ultimately get. So it's not uh, it's not as clear as any monogenic disorder, even though it's a dominant mode of uh, of inheritance. It's been shown uh, that uh, that the, the children you can uh, they have uh, a very different LPA levels than than their uh, than their their mothers and fathers and you cannot really estimate it so you really have to to measure it and for people that are asking the question at what time I should get an LPA measurement let's say if I had uh, a heart attack at an early age and I want to prevent that in uh, in my children then we know that the uh, LPA gene is fully expressed by age two uh, in the liver of course uh, and that the levels that you will get at five years old are probably uh, going to remain um, uh, the, this well maybe not the same levels but if you have but high levels by age five, five yeah, yeah, yeah. so it'll probably increase through adulthood but very very slowly yeah so again some very important information there right piece one of that is you cannot predict the phenotype of the offspring from the phenotype of the parents and let's contrast this with apoe the gene by the way, there's a lot of parallels between APOE and LPA. APOE is a gene that today doesn't seem to serve much of a purpose. All it seems to do is increase your risk of Alzheimer's disease and even increase your risk of cardiovascular disease, independent of that. Um, there are three isoforms, the two, three, four type, and it's this fourth type that's high risk. So you can argue, how in the world does this gene exist? And of course, the answer is evolution wasn't really thinking about Alzheimer's disease. So therefore, there must have been some benefit of it. And of course, we now know there is, right? This, this genotype was associated with protection from parasitic infections in the brain, um, which would have been far more to our advantage 100,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, than the downside of Alzheimer's disease in your 70s or 80s. Um, but with APOE, because you have these three discrete isoforms, you only have six combinations. And therefore, if you know what the parents isoforms are, you can probabilistically give a distribution for what the children will be. You still would need to measure it, of course, but there's a finite number of outcomes. Now, of course, there you're measuring genotype and not phenotype. We don't measure the phenotype of APOE yet. So here you have so many genes that are associated with this thing that if the parents are both elevated, the probability that the offspring are going to be elevated seems pretty high. If one parent is elevated and the other is not, there's a pretty decent chance 
that the offspring will not. Tell me about the situation in which both parents are not elevated, but yet could carry genes that, or could carry variants of LPA that when combined could elevate. Do, is that, has that been observed? Or does one safely say, if both of your parents are below 30 milligrams per deciliter, the probability that you are going to be north of 50 is very small. I think it's very small, but you still have to to measure it, uh, Peter. I, 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 to be honest, I don't think I would know the answer to that. Uh, so that's why we we simply um, suggest to measure LPA. Well, the guidelines now, most guidelines will tell you to measure it in everybody at least once uh, in their lifetime. But and when do the guidelines that suggest that that start? Do the guidelines suggest doing it in <laughs> adolescence? when you have a long enough runway to take action if the um, LP little a is elevated? Or do they not specify? I don't think they, they specify that. And the, the, the guidelines are actually just starting to uh, advise for, for LPA measurements. So some, some guidelines, uh, like the American Heart Association guidelines, uh, which are um, probably the um, less favorable for LPA measurement, they'll tell you to measure I don't remember exactly, but in patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or with a, a family history of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, in patients with familial hypercholesterolemia or in patients with aortic valve stenosis. So, but the guidelines don't usually tell you So in other words, when measure should... the LP little a once they've demonstrated that the disease that it causes is present. Yeah, pr pretty much. <laughs> that's fantastic advice. So, that's, so, that's excellent so the, if you look answer. at the yeah, but if you look at the Canadian guidelines, though, they'll tell they'll tell you to measure it yeah. in everybody at least once in their in their lifetime. So there's and, and really by the way, an, this is where Canadians also stand out over Americans. Canadians have long adopted the measurement of ApoB as the superior measurement to quantify LDL risk, and yet here in the United States, the guidelines still favor the use of LDL cholesterol which is clearly inferior to ApoB. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I, I would like to comment on, on that. I think, I think the, the Canadian guidelines are, are much more up to date with the, with the recent uh, literature on that. There's clearly no, no doubt about it. But uh, As are the to, European to guidelines the... while we're on the topic. Right? Yeah, the exactly, European guidelines, exactly. the Canadian guidelines are in line with the available evidence and the United States guidelines are you know, just 40 years out of date, but that's all. Yeah, absolutely. And the European guidelines, actually, they they advised to measure LPA in everybody for a different reason. It was to identify patients who have very, very high LPA levels because we realize uh, throughout the years that the uh, having a super high LPA might be a cause for familial hypercholesterolemia. Mm. So, um, so, and you need to measure LDL to diagnose uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. And uh, after the uh, after mutation in the LDL receptor mutation uh, or variation in the LPA gene might even be the second cause of familial hypercholesterolemia. And the reason for that is quite simple, because when you measure LDL, uh, you also measure LPA cholesterol. So if you have uh, a very high LDL and also a very high LPA, there's a very good chance that the high LDL cholesterol will actually be high LPA uh, cholesterol. So, um, so yeah, this is, I, th I think it's really underappreciated. Uh, and, and, and actually, that's the reason why it's in the European guidelines. Uh, but now I think uh, most of the guidelines that will, that will be uh, put forward will just simply, for whatever reason, to measure uh, LPA at least once. And I don't know if it's in the pediatric guidelines because I don't really follow that that literature. But uh, maybe in children uh, who have strokes at uh, a young age, many of them have uh, high LPA. So it's not uh, as um, as clean as the literature in adults, but there's been a, a lot of studies looking at high LPA and stroke in children. So uh, if you have a, a family history uh, or relatives that had a stroke at a, at a young age, it might be a good idea to, uh, to, to measure LPA as well.
Yeah, that's actually a terrifying thought, by the way. Um, you know, my view on these things, of course, is just that the amount of energy that goes into debating it is so ridiculous compared to the relatively low cost of simply measuring the thing. The, um, the, the people who debate why, uh, why would you spend $14 on an APOB test? It's like, if your life isn't worth $14, we shouldn't be having this discussion. Uh, same is true for measuring LP little a. So uh, I think it should be done on everybody, non-negotiable, certainly before your 18th birthday. That would be my, that would be my, thinking on this.